Bakalım mesela bir seyahat geldi. Tek, o gelmiş dedik Seçimi mi? seçeceğiz demişlerdim. Ya gelmiş.
Merhaba hocam. Merhaba hocam. Hoş geldiniz. Hoş bulduk. Ya yani bu şey recording'e başladıktan sonra başlatsak olmaz mı şimdi? Boş boşuna Yani siz bilirsiniz. Yok yok doğru. Ben şey arkadaş buradaydı da unuttum ona basmayı. Hello everyone. Welcome to the another session of Erasmus Academic Erasmus Academic Talks series uh, organized by Batman University for the spring semester. Uh, the speaker of this week will be uh, one of the celebrated academics of our university, Batman University. Associate Professor Dr. Harika Süklün. Uh, before passing to the talk session, I would like to, I will be pleased to introduce uh, Associate Professor Harika Süklün to our participants and dear students. Associate Professor Süklün received her Associate Degree of Science in, in 1997 a Bachelor of Science in 1998, and her master degree in business administration from Western Kentucky University. A strong, as a strong advocate of learning, Dr. Suklin completed uh, her PhD in business administration with a focus on conflict management at Sullivan University in 2014. Dr. Suklin, uh, lived in the USA for nearly 30 years and returned to Turkey in 2017 at Abdullah Gül University as a faculty member and served as the head of the Department of Business Administration until 2023. Dr. Suklin's research areas include migration, women's study, conflict management, and communication. Associate Professor Suklin joined Batman University in March 2023. Uh, Professor Suklin, thank you very much again for uh, accepting our invitation to, to
to give uh, such a uh, so to give a uh, lecture on such a popular topic. Uh, but before before your uh, talk, I would like to give the speech to to the head of our uh, office, Associate Professor Yusuf Chinar. Uh, Yusuf Ojang, would you like to add something else to our dear speaker and our participants? Thank you very much. Uh, every week, uh, the International Relations Office organizes uh, Erasmus Academic Talks. Uh, I would like to thank uh, all of them uh, because uh, this program really uh, participating uh, very important details to us and uh, especially uh, this week our guest from international relations office Hari Koja professor uh, the, I would like to thank uh, especially intercultural uh, communication is very important uh, title and I am very excited to listen the presentation uh, inshallah the program will be very good thank you very much again thank you very much professor and uh Arika Süklün, professor uh, associate professor dr arika Süklün, the stage is yours uh we can't wait thank you thank you dr Ishik. thank you for a nice introduction i am um excited to be here and uh, hopefully uh you will enjoy what we are gonna talk about, um, let me share my screen first, then we'll go from there. Uh, hope everyone can see, but okay, there it is, okay. Yeah, we can see. Okay, good, good. Um, about the question, are we gonna take the question at the end or... Um, just should I stop and answer the questions if any question comes up? Uh, traditionally, uh, we take the questions at the end of the session. If you want, we can go in, in that way as usual. That's fine. I just don't want to change the, the system, whatever. I mean, uh, it's um, up to you. It's up to you. You, you, okay, are, okay. you are the boss right now. So <laughs> yeah. you can Thank conduct you. as you wish. Yeah. Here, the only problem will be I will not be able to see the questions if it's typed in the chat room. So if you stop me and... Uh, and yeah, I will check uh, from from time to time the chat box. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, let's start yeah. then. Um, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I think it's afternoon everywhere, I guess. Um, I When I've been asked, to give this speech, um, I decided to this subject because as um, Dr. Chinar said, it, it is important and is becoming more important than before. So before I go into um, intercultural, intercultural communication, I will talk a little bit about um, communication and culture. I'm sure you all thought about this, but just to recall our memories, what it is. So um, what is inter, uh, what is communication? So it's a broad term, refers to transfer of information from one entity to another. Here we are gonna talk about human beings in terms of process or systems. And at, as you know, without any communication, we cannot exist. That's actually communication uh, makes us human beings, right? If you cannot communicate, what is the whole point? And um, in the world, there are many type of communication. Even when we look at the, the animals, like um, living creatures, all of them communicate in some way. They have their own style. So in this speech or in this program, um, I will talk about verbal and nonverbal communication. Um, in addition to those, of course, there are like uh, co um, communication and using by symbols and other, um, other forms of communication, but I will talk about mostly in verbal and nonverbal uh, communication. And so, um, 
as humans, we use uh, language, which is kind of like symbols, make um, the sentences made up with words and every word has some meanings, right? Right now, when I'm talking, you do understand what I'm saying, but if I say this in another language, probably you will not be um, understand, which I don't speak another language on the Turkish and English. <laughs> So um, the reason that we um, communicate is express ideas and express ourselves and also exchange information. That's the uh, main reason that we communicate. And to understand the message, so there is, um, the communication is two ways, okay? In one point, there is a sender, and of course, it has to be a receiver that the message that we are sending. Although we do talk to ourselves time to time, which I do all the time. I do talk to my computer. I do talk to my phone and everything, but we are not completing that in this, okay? Because it's not two ways because my phone cannot answer what I am saying. So um, I love this. It's not important what you said. It's very important how you said, and we'll go into that. Okay, um, nonverbal communication is um, more important than verbal communications. Why? Uh, I'll give you an example. The word really, okay? Really, just a simple meaning, really. Okay, just wash my face and you will understand when I use the same word what I mean, right? Really? So I'm kind of surprised, right? Really? I'm kind of sarcastic. Really? Like asking for clarification. And just using just one word, I sent message to the receiver to other side what I really meant, right? So it is very important. And uh, when we are talking about nonverbal communication, we are talking about eye contact, body position, and unfortunately, now we are online, I cannot make an eye contact, but it is very important. Please keep on keeping your mind. And gestures and facial expressions. Gestures, we are talking about like hands movements and you know all kind of stuff. And personal space, touching, petting, caressing, and hitting. It also gives, um, it, in this way, we do communicate too. Like um, if when you are talking to someone, if you get very close, what does it mean? You are sending a message. Actually, you are communicating at that time. You are kind of threatening that person, right? So you are uh, trying to show your power over that person. So that includes uh, body language too. And the pitch tone volume also is under uh, nonverbal communication. Tone of voice is very important. Um, as I gave you example a while ago, uh, really, the word really, actually, I used um, my voice of tone and also I used my um, facial expressions, right? And here, according to the, um, the research, during our communication, 55% um, is nonverbal and 38% is vocal and only 7% is word. So nonverbal communication makes 93% of the communication. So it is very important. Okay, I put this one. Um, I mean, without any word, we can understand how this person is feeling, right? Not feeling or having reaction to us. Like if you say something to, when you, when you look at the first picture, when you say something and if you observe this face, you will understand what, right? So, okay, now let's look at culture. Culture is not, uh, uh, culture doesn't come by birth, okay? It's not um, genetically uh, transmitted. It is learned um, through language, the culture that we live in. So it includes language. Um, that's why there are many languages, right? And customs attitudes, and art, drama, music, all of it, and food, and faith, religion, behavior, rituals. So it includes the culture. 
um, even when we think about culture in same area, uh, let's say in, in same country, um, but in different regions, we can see different cultures, right? Uh, for example, when you go to north of Turkey, the food changes, right? And if you look at the southern region, it changes too. They have more spicy food than a northern part and all kind of stuff. So if I keep going, uh, giving you an example of this, there's no way that I can stop. So also I do want to uh, mention that uh, since this is intercultural communication, it means that uh, two people trying to um, communicate with a common language, but their native um, language is, uh, is not the same one. And <laughs> Excuse me. Even when we um, communicate in our um, native language, we do always have problems, right? Uh, I'm sure uh, you all had the same problem, but you you explain what the person, the receiver, cannot get, right? What you are saying. I'm not saying that that person's problem. You may have the problem you may not be able to send a clear message to the receiver, right? So it happens, uh, conflicts that uh, based on the communication, it uh, it is true for our, um, you know, other, our, in, in our uh, native language. So, uh, well, uh, this is the recent information. Uh, there are about 65,000 to 70,000 spoken language exist in the world today. And here is the most used languages. So English used 1.35 billion people um, and Mandarin, which is Chinese, 1.12 uh, billion speakers, Spanish uh, 543 million and Arabic is 274 uh, million uh, people speak those languages. So those are active languages. And I want you to think about it. Let's say I put here thousand, but think about it less than thousand. Let's say 50 people, put 50 people together that they do speak different languages and ask them to work together. And can you imagine the chaos? And, and of course they will not have any uh, common languages that they can communicate. So, um, Inter, inter, we can call it intercultural communication if you ask what it is. So it's the capabilities passes through three paces. This is according to Hofsetz, and he is a very well known um, person or scientist. Say that uh, he come up with different cultural dimensions, and he said that they included about seventy six countries in the world, and. I don't know if you are familiar with his uh, cultural dimensions, but that's another subject. Well, okay, I'm not gonna go into that. Okay, so the first one is awareness. Um, we have to be aware of differences, okay? Um, especially right now with technology and social media and everything, I have a doubt that nobody's, you know, I don't think there are many people that are not aware that there are different cultures, um, different races and all kinds of stuff. Okay, we got that, we, now we are aware. And then now we have to learn, gain knowledge about other culture, okay? And um, we have to, not to understand, but know how they treat each other, right? Uh, for example, I'm, I'm sure you saw this, but uh, when we greet, people, we act in a different way. Uh, in Turkey, if that person is older than you are, what we do, I, I don't know if we still do that because I'm, I'm an older person now, but we kiss hands, right? We kiss hands and then we put on our um, head, forehead because what, what does it mean? Because of respect. It means like, okay, you are elder than me, you are, you have more experience and et cetera. But on the other hand, when we look at um, you know most of the Asian countries, let's say uh, China and Japan, what they do, they bow, and this is the way they uh, show respect to um, respect to you know other other uh, people. 
And also I saw that uh, in a one meeting, we had lots of Chinese faculties around and when they hand me their uh, business card, they hand it with two hands. Um, that's their custom. It's very really good uh, for them to give you the card like this, which what we do here, right? We just handed the card, but they have to put it this way. So um, that's that's understanding. So understanding leads us not to be offended, right? And also not to offend other people if we are in um, in that kind of situation, which is true again, as in um, national or regional culture too. And also encoding, decoding, recording, and translating language. So that's the differences uh, with our native languages, which I also mentioned that there are uh, some problems, but here we have to translate the language to be able to understand and effectively communicate. So this is an extra thing, and that's why um, usually, you know, especially at the beginning, we do have problems, right? Because we have um, a set mind in a specific language, and then we think that way. Then when you are trying to learn another or try to speak or communicate with another language, you have to change it all. You have to change it and you have to uh, pass the other side. So it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. Uh, I will talk about two studies that um, I have done. So the first one included uh, 16 professional immigrant women. Uh, this professional immigrant woman, by the, like they have higher degree and they have, um, you know, specialized areas, which included the faculties, uh, doctors and uh, CEOs and um, bank managers and all kinds of stuff. And the 16 professional uh, women included different part of um, the world. So I didn't use a female from the same country. So just to get a better, better understanding what is going on. And also this, uh, one of the criteria was uh, English has to be their second language because I had to, I, I wanted to look at it, the accent, how accent um, impacts the communication in both sides. And also they are, they were either uh, US citizens or they hold um, green card. So if I couldn't include anybody there, uh, not legally in the United States. Uh, after the first study, then question come up. Okay, here now we heard what uh, non-native speakers, professional immigrant women feels and faces some conflicts. And now we know how they, um, how they um, work to overcome with those challenges. Then, okay, here it is. They are in a different country and they are, trying to live in a different culture, which include everything, right? Faith and, and language and so on. Well, how about the other side? Okay, here, I'm a native person. I am, you know, English is my native language. And here, there are people that totally different than I am. So what is going on in my world, okay? In, in a workplace, what's going on? And also, I would like to mention that, um, in both uh, immigrant women and professional native women, they had subordinates, uh, like international subordinates. Uh, professional immigrant women, they had uh, American subordinates uh, they, because they were in a management position. And same for the native women, they had international uh, subordinates. They had to work with internationals to uh, answer our questions, right? Okay. Uh, so I already mentioned a little bit, but accent is kind of our identity, right? So it um, identifies and set people apart and they are a tool of for quick judgment. Isn't it true here even that like we do speak um, uh, same language, right? We speak, um, most of the Turkish speak uh, Turkish, but uh, I'm not sure if I can call it accent, maybe it, it could be called dialogue, but I'm not sure. But anyways, 
So when we listen to someone, we can understand that that person is from northern um, northern Turkey. Uh, I'm not making any discrimination. It just comes to my mind very quickly. And or um, when we listen to someone, let's say um, west northwest of Turkey, they have um, they the way that they do talk is totally different. That so we can't say okay okay here this person is from there or oh, that person is from there. Here we made a, already a decision, right? Is it really important when we communicate? Actually, not. Okay, but that's what happens. And also, it reveals the speaker's national and regional origin, races, classes, and 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 level of education. Uh, especially in the United States or countries like you know they receive uh, lots of um, migrants. Uh, I'm sure some of you you've been in um, in other countries. Uh, just hearing your accent could be a negative or a positive way just to start the conversation or the communication. So we hope that it's not going to be a negative effect, but of course it is possible. So, um, which I saw that when like, okay, when I was in the United States, when I started talking and they were trying to ask, just listening to my accent to find out where I am originally. And now, because if they are not very um, accustomed to my accent, then they would strictly ask me where I am from. And then I would start like playing, okay, guess where? I mean, I heard lots of things like Russia, California, and all kind of stuff. Um, well, in, in communication, it is important also people to keep communication level. Uh, let's not think about only, um, you know, in, in a negative way, but it also has some positive way too. Okay, here um, I put the differences of the studies uh, to show you or talk about it, uh, immigrant professionals and anti professionals, um, the same question that we ask. Okay, so the right side is, okay, listening a person with accent, and the left side is speaking with an accent, okay? So um, most of the women mentioned that it's a good way to start a communication. Again, uh, this study is conducted in the United States, which is, you know, um, people are very familiar with different cultures and languages. And, um, you know, when you are waiting online, if you talk to someone in your language, they may ask like, oh, where are you from? And so they start just like chit-chatting, okay? Or they say, oh, you have a very cute accent. Where are you from? And then the communication starts from there. And, um, but uh, at workplaces, it is true also, um, they might be a little bit, again, those are what um, participants told us. Uh, it started a little bit confusing. Although they are a little bit nervous at the beginning, the native people, native speakers, let's put that way, then, um, you know, they do get comfortable after, uh, after a while. And um, so, they said that when they talk, people claim that uh, they do not hear them, uh, which they found very offensive. Um, like you talk, you talk, you talk. And then um, instead of saying, uh, I don't understand what you are talking about, they go like, okay, I don't hear you very well. Could you repeat it, please? Just doing being a nice side, their side, of course, but in their side, um, they found offensive. And some of them wish that they didn't have an accent, which, um, I mean, most of them, they loved being there. They enjoyed living in the United States, but they, you know, criticized as well. And yes, although they said that they wish that they didn't have an accent, but on the other hand, they said that, yes, it is part of our identity because it releases our inf uh, information about us. And then uh, interest in a foreign accent, that's, I gave you an example. When they hear that you have an accent, then you do get uh, questions, okay? Um, so, uh, but 
sometimes it cannot be interest too. They may just block and then not listen to you at all. And also, not being a native English speaker and having an accent often prevented them from advancing their careers, which I heard um, this a lot. It's um, the way that they feel, okay? Uh, I do remember one older lady, she, um, she was in a very upper level management position and she got an offer, but she turned it down because she didn't have enough confidence to talk in front of public. Because whatever you do, you have an accent, okay? This is the way they felt. And because of that, they didn't take those kind of promotions because of confidence, self-confidence about their languages. Okay, uh, here, when you look at the native professional woman, they said that they misunderstand uh, because of word selection, word choice. Um, English has many, many words. I don't remember how many millions word um, the language uh, includes. Because of that, one word may have a different meanings, five, six different meanings. So when you use in, uh, you know, during the communication, if you are not a native speaker, it is really hard to, it, it, is, it is possible that you use the wrong way. Okay, so that's what it happens. There is um, then there is a misunderstandings, you know, and um, yeah, they said that it takes time to get used to accents because um, I mean, you know, every language uh, has different <coughs> different tone of voice, and they use you know the tongue in a different way. And because of that, there are different accents. And really it's, uh, some of the accents are harder than the others to understand. But again, um, yes, it takes time, but then you will you will get used to hear all kinds of accents. And as uh, well, they also mentioned some accents are uh, harder to understand others, but again, it takes time. And able to recognize speaker's background of origin or where the non, uh, a non uh, speaker was from. I gave you an example at the beginning. They said the same thing. And um, yes, they can guess. Uh, but again, they can guess if they are really familiar with that accent. As I told you, I've been asked lots of time because they were not um, used to my accent. And also, um, on the this is very interesting. Uh, they felt that you know, because of self-confidence, they turned down the promotions, but also um, the native professional women, they witnessed the same thing uh, because they're in a management position. Probably they may, um, they may, they witnessed that a woman, international woman or, you know, a professional immigrant woman couldn't get a promotion because of that, because they were into that process. And or you know they postpone their um, they postpone their promotion to go up, and they also um, the accent was um, okay. Let me one. Okay, no. Okay, so here um, we are going to look at an effect and understanding. Uh, I heard this a lot and they hate it. They hate it. Um, but it's interesting that it's the same way. Okay, here, um, international people, I'll say it international people, but you know what I mean. Um, they start a conversation and you kept talking and talking and the other person just nodding, you know, like giving you a message that, yeah, I got it and blah, blah, blah. And then at the end, you ask a question, actually you lost that person a long time ago. And that person pretended they understood you, okay? And it just, um, they found that very offensive too. And on the other hand, um, the team professional woman, they felt the same way, okay? They said that they act like they 
act like they, they pretend that they understand, but at the end of the conversation or during the conversation, when we ask a question, we just recognize that they, they didn't get it. You know, we lost them in some point. It should be, you know, different reasons or many reasons. And also, um, immigrant professional women felt stressed about not knowing all of the complex meaning and ever-changing rules of English. Um, well, if you are not using your native language, or, you know, it's very natural that you will feel that the rules are changing. Um, like, what, you know, somewhere you say I, but then in some words you say E, that kind of uh, differences that they were talking about. Um, and some, you know, even native speaker cannot explain it that way. And without questioning, you have to learn it that way. And they found that that's, um, that's difficult. And, um, and also, yes, um, they know that not knowing enough words to uh, rephrase sentences sometimes lead to misunderstanding. Well, when you need to rephrase, um, you know, a sentence or a statement, obviously you couldn't send a message uh, to the receiver and then you got feedback, then you feel that you have to rephrase it. Well, when you rephrase it, you have to change the um, structure of the grammar or you have to change the word, right? And plus you use your body language. Um, well, to use different words, of course, your vocabulary, you have to have a rich vocabulary to rephrase the statement. And having problems with idioms, yes, they had, but it is also, um, I think it's natural. I mean, uh, I lived there about 30 years. I still had some problems because, you know, I heard some meetings I've never heard before. I had to ask them, what does it mean? So they explained to me. So if I, if you never heard it, of course, you will have a problem because it's kind of related with the culture, right? And think about it. We have lots of idioms. And when we translate to English, it doesn't make any sense because that idioms has a meaning for us. So that creates a problem. And having fear of not being understood and making mistakes. So it makes them kind of like, you know, slow down or be nervous during a communication um, because they do hear, because it happens a lot or often, let's put that way, that, um, they were, you know, misunderstood by by others, so that uh, became very nervous. Sometimes um, felt offended as some words uh, used daily in their native language were not culturally expected in the United States, um, like um, disappointment. Uh, it is very rude in the United States to tell someone that you are disappointed, like you know, telling someone straight to their face, oh, I am disappointed on you. This is very rude, very mean. But here, for example, in Turkey, we use it all the time, right? We use our kids and we're like, ah, you disappointed me. It's not a big deal. But over there, it's important. And uh, and also, I do remember uh, one lady um, when she went, during her first month or two, I don't remember, an early time, after migrating there, she went to a hairstylist and um, she asked lady to make her hair Negro style, okay? That Negro word, it's forbidden, okay? It is forbidden, you cannot say it. It's called N-words, okay? When you say N-words, everybody understand what you are talking about. So you have to say African-American, that kind of things. But, uh, you know, being there first time, you never know, which, uh, remember, we had a cookie called Negro. Now they changed the name. And the lady was a black uh, lady. And of course, she understood from her um, facial expression that she made mistakes and she apologized and all kinds of stuff. So um, you may find yourself in that kind of situation. So. And um, they also offended when native professionals slow their speech to noticeable degree. And it made them very pissed because 
once they figure out that you you are not native English speaker, uh, they slow down, say the word very slowly, you know, like, I am telling you not to do that, you know, the way that we sometimes say to our kids, right? And I mean, they were like, we are not stupid. We are not stupid. You don't have to slow down. It's just English is our uh, second language. So when we look at the other side and um, when, during the, um, you know, conversation or communication, they attempt to be respectful and appreciative, which uh, I can say that, uh, you know, they are, uh, they appreciate the differences. They appreciate different cultures. Uh, when they slow a conversation, uh, conversation to better ensure understanding. So this slowing down happens on the other side too, but it's it, it's not a problem for them. They just wait that person to you know make a clear sentence or express the, uh, herself or himself in a better way. And also they think that immigrants tend to be more reserved and less talkative in interactions and. Um, Again, as I mentioned, uh, this woman, they have international subordinates. Uh, so they find them less interact, uh, talkative and interactions. But when we look at this side, we know why, right? Because of all this fear, right? And being afraid of, um, you know, being misunderstood or making a mistake. So they decided they kind of like isolated themselves they uh, communicate in a minimum way, only when it's necessary. Uh, well, I already mentioned the next one and uh, pretend to understand is to avoid, they think that they pretend to, they pretend that they understand is not to uh, look foolish. Um, well, on the other side, I'm not sure if it is true, but immigrant, uh, immigrant uh, women, they didn't think uh, why they act like that way. But uh, native uh, people, uh, females, they think that they pretended this way because of this and not to offend um, their, um, the native speakers, English speakers. Uh, during these two studies, this comes up very often, being a um, direct person. So um, again, when we ask questions, they always, you know, refer the people they work for them, not with them, for them. Again, uh, that they have subordinates. I mean, they have coworkers also. Um, if there's one faculty, um, I do remember there was one faculty from Germany. Of course, she was working with other faculties. And okay, for them, being direct person is is an honesty. Um, I think we do take the same way here in Turkey in our culture, right? Like, hey, I'm not lying. I'm just telling you to your face straight. And they don't understand the sugar coating, like, you know, making the words better and try to, you know, it's like, like, okay, whatever it is, this it is, okay, take it or leave it. And uh, in a work, they also all agreed that, especially in a work environment, that is necessary and it's efficient because there is no time to chit chatting or keeping a long conversations, right? And also, <laughs> they also mentioned that uh, being direct person is um, stems from um, their culture. So, uh, but in the United States, again, it is kind of um, being a direct, if, if someone's telling you that you are a direct person, actually that's a war, warning. So you have to be a little bit careful. Um, so again, uh, the quotations that I took, they referred a coworker. So I always thought this person is um, a very critical and a direct. So being a direct person means as a, you are a critical person, you criticize everything. This is the way, um, you know, as a culture, this is the way they take it. Um, I would say that it is uncomfortable because I'm not used to uh, people doing it. Well, you know, it's important for their point because you never seen people around you like that. And then here, some people comes up and acts like this. Well, they do feel um, uncomfortable. Um, they try to be direct to simplify communication and limit what they are asking. Again, they were thinking that because they are that way, 
because they don't want to keep going and around, right? And they just want to to say in a short way whatever they want to say. I don't know if it's true or not, but that that they have that feel. Uh, they had been socialized locally to be nice as an expectation of gender, and they like it when other women are not. Um, this is kind of like a cruel statement. And, um, and also they agree that immigrant professionals being direct are not perceived positively in the workplace. I mean, it, because it's the cultural norms, right? If it's a cultural norm, it, it is naturally uh, would be that way. And... <laughs> Uh, well, I, I had the same experience too, because once my manager told me that he was afraid of me when I asked why, he said, well, you are so direct person. I was like, what is wrong with that? You know, because I was at, taking exactly the same way. And uh, in the US, immigrants are far more accustomed to positive word choices using elaboration or even sugar coating words to increase the likelihood of positive reception, even though more direct manner of speech would be less time consuming and more, and more uh, honest. So they were kind of like, um, they do understand that it comes from their culture, but same time they were saying that, you know, they kind of like changed uh, to um, their behavior. And here, uh, try to see how they cope with language problems in, in a communication in workplaces. So uh, here, immigrant professionals, they establish a way with a foreign culture to cope with uh, communication problems, warning and listening about their language. So before they start, they give a message of like, hey, English is my native language, so it means like I may not follow you well, or uh, when I say something, I don't want to offend you, right? I don't want to be offensive, so it's just like like a message. And most of them said the same thing, making fun of they uh, fun of their uh, themselves. Um, they try to cope with problem in a you know using my humor, and also they use humor. When they made a mistake, uh, let's say grammatical mistakes, or let's say that they use a different word, before anybody says anything, they just start making fun of themselves. Why? Because they don't want to give any chance to anybody to make fun of themselves, right? They just block it there. Hey, look, I know I made a mistake, but I'm aware of it, and it was funny. So that's, what, again, kind of like defending themselves. And also to understand uh, better, uh, they observe body language to better understand and uh, using only the words they know and feel comfortable using a dialogue with a native English speaker. So we saw uh, in the previous uh, slide that they were uncomfortable, right? With their uh, choosing the words and all kind of stuff. So instead of that, this is how they cope with that. Uh, they use the words that they know well, the meaning or meanings. Um, so that was their way. And for a native a professional uh, woman, they repeat statements. Uh, just when they show from the facial experiences and with the language, they saw that they lost the listener. So, so th they repeat statements, that's how they cope. And asking confirmation questions such as, do you understand? Um, again, when we think about it, especially in Turkish, uh, do you understand is kind of like a rude way to ask someone, right? Did you get it? Do you understand what I'm saying? But over there is not like, do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, so just to clarify, understanding the receiver, okay? And asking, do you know what I mean to qualify meaning again? Um, like, okay, receiving a feedback from the receiver tells you if that message is um, clearly understood or not. So when you when they have a doubt, they say, like, do you know what I mean, right? So then the other person says no, then um, they will um, rephrase what they are saying. And same as others, uh, the other side, uh, observe facial expression for contextual cues such as smile or frown, confusion or understanding. Um, again, it, it, you know, it's um, 
it just come up naturally uh, because every so uh, body language is is very important. Which what what was it ninety three percent that we use body language in our communications. And a slowing speech pace. Uh, actually, you know, slowing speech pace. They they had a good intentions, right? They wanted to the other um, the non-native speakers to understand what they were saying, but on the other hand, they felt they didn't feel good. You know, they didn't uh, appreciate that they slow um, speech pace. Asking a recipient to repeat back what was said or what is expected uh, of her making uh, a request. It's not exactly, okay, tell me what I told you. It's not, of course, that way, but asking with some questions to clarify the message um, received well. And also making attempts to be friendly. So, um, Speaker might feel welcome, avoiding automatic experiences and attentive listening. And uh, obviously they find that that um, the idioms, you know, create problems. And I mean, I know that a bunch of um, people that they like here, um, not everybody's familiar with those idioms. That, that's a really good uh, way um, to cope with these problems, not to use idioms, you know, um, put in heavily. And conversations. So. so, in overall, um, I put this. So they felt that it had to work harder than native professional to prove them themselves, and face many language and cultural challenges. Since this study, uh, you know, um, included based on intercultural communication and the the. the uh, conflict that come from the language barriers, but also it's a female study. It's, it's includes only women's, right? So uh, when they talk about it, they they didn't feel comfortable. They didn't think that uh, they have uh, the same chance as native um, professionals. Just being an international person, uh, they felt like they have to work hard, which all of them uh, said the same thing. They said that they, ha they had to work very hard to come to that position. And uh, cultural differences, uh, I do remember one of the lady telling me that uh, at workplace, they were just talking about just chatting during the lunch hours, and uh, they start talking about uh, TV series. See, it happens, but they don't think that you are an international person. Maybe you were not there in, let's say, early um, 70s, right? <laughs> so in a good you know, intention, she was like kind of shocked and she asked this um, male subordinate his age. Oh no, that's the wrong thing to do in the, in the United States. It became an HR issue because he went and he filed a complaint that um, that she asked uh, personal information, et cetera. So they had troubles on that in, when we look at it at a cultural level. And uh, again, it's one of the important part of our culture is food, right? Um, some of them, um, as I said, there were, all these women were from different parts of the world. Uh, like from India, China. Uh, I, I would say that because they use different spices, uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not criticizing anybody, but because of taste or spices is not accepted well in other culture, uh, they complain that uh, they found their food disgusting. Which in this case, what would happen? I mean, you don't have to take your lunch to work, just make a sandwich or something like that. But they found it that um, challenging. And starting with how, how are you? They never understand. They were like, how come you can't ask a person? Um, no, no. I mean, how are you? They they say that, well, just they are asking. They don't care if you are really good or not. You know, if you are let it's like, well, I'm well, I'm not good. I'm this, this, this. And they believe that they're not going to listen to you. Um, but their culture, if you ask someone, how are you, and you, you really mean it. You are really interested in to hear what other person's feeling, if it's sick or, or, or blah, blah, blah. 
uh, saying hi to strangers is it, it, it's very weird for them. They never understand. And one Russian lady um, said that when uh, he moved to when she moved to United States in a market, somebody said hi. And she was about to go and fight with that person. And she was like, do you know me? Why are you telling me hi and blah, blah, blah. And of course, you know, after living there, they got used to it. But it was it was a problem. And they do still have some time. Um, you know, they, they have hard time to accept that. This is that true in Turkey, too. We don't say hi to um, strangers, right? Even we do not smile, which I do time to time. But I, I'm trying to stop myself. And um, attempt to assimilate and adapt those efforts often contradict native uh, characteristics, which is um, that part is really hard. Um, like, let's say clothes. Clothes are a part of our culture, right? Um, if you were your native um, clothes, they will not be accepted well in workplace over there or some religious issues, right? Which I never witnessed. I'm talking about myself over there, that kind of uh, discrimination. But again, these ladies from um, different, uh, they lived in different states in the United States. So to challenge is that it becomes a struggle when losing one's personal identity in effort to fit in a, uh, into the new culture. Um, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> That's why um, first they called it a uh, melting pot all in, in the United States, all of the different cultures that they lived um, together. But then the idea came up that uh, melting pot, uh, think about it, when you put everything in a melting pot, they melt, right? So when you taste it, you cannot tell what is in it because everything melts and just combined. And because of that, they come to another um um, not a statement and a word, they call solid bowl. Well, in a solid, yes, it's a bunch of things, right? There's um, lettuce, cucumbers, tomatoes, parsley, whatever, you name it, right? But still, you can see the differences. Yes, they are all together, but you can um, recognize the lettuce, you can recognize and taste the cucumbers or tomatoes and, all, and so on. Um, after that, I'm not sure if another terms come up or not, but that was the things. Okay, so what what is it about the, the uh, about multicultural appreciation awareness is showing openness, tolerance, and interest of diversity of um, individuals. And even when I do teach, I always remember my students that none of the culture is superior to other one. None of this uh, culture is better than the other one. Because cultures do not pop up within a day or within a year, right? All of them has very, very old history and based on different values. So in workplaces or in our uh, lives, you know, in a daily lives, we have to respect all and we have to um, accept to I mean, get potential to kind of like prevent potential negative conflicts at workplaces organizations should foster an environment where all employees generally accept and find ways to appreciate the differences among one culture uh, in the united states i think they do this in in a good way maybe it needs some more improvements but again uh, i worked there as a professional and i never felt that, you know, um, I wasn't appreciated. I mean, I, you know, there were some small things, but it wasn't a big deal. So thank you. And now I will have a question. I will entertain your questions if you have any, and I hope you enjoy. <laughs> and I will stop sharing, or maybe should I keep, hmm. if there's a question. Uh, <clears throat> okay, Professor Suklun, thank you very much. For this very uh, detailed, really uh, stimulating presentation, because it's it's really it's really popular topic for for those interested in especially in social sciences or who one else uh, uh, you know who one else uh, adopted into uh, a kind of any kind of social life because if we you know, if we are up to live 
uh, rather than uh, individuality. So we are most probably to come across and encounter such, you know, such issues, interactions within the society, in right. any kinds of society. I, I'm really oh. pleased to, you know, uh, to re, uh, re watch such uh, presentation uh, in relation to my, my uh, you know, courses for my students. Uh, Yusuf Oja, uh, is he still here? Uh, before we go there, I'm sorry. Um, okay, I just please, want please, to please, end, please uh, to mm -hmm. add what you said. Uh, it's not only living in a society, right? Uh, especially if we have any students here, uh, the things are changing, right? And probably when they uh, start their professional life, it's not going to be office um, offices, maybe. I mean, there are lots of guests going around, and which is in my field, we are trying to find how people are going to work. So especially our students at young age, uh, probably they are working online, okay? So it's going to be harder for them because when you are face to face, you can use your body language more effectively, right? And, but all the cultural differences are going to be there. It's not going to be changed because if you're not a native speaker in any languages, you will have these problems, even if you communicate online or face to face. So this is very important for, um, for next generations too, that they will be professional, which is gonna be more than what we face today, right? Because of all this globalization and uh, technology that we do reach, you know, other part of the world very easily, but we have to pay attention to this. If you wanna uh, be in part, or if you wanna be in, you know, in that situation or in that position. So those are very important that we don't want to be left out. I'm sorry. I just wanted to add that. Since thinking no, that we no, have no, no. Uh, students here, it is important. <laughs> it was great to have another supplementary comment on this topic on uh, Thank you. along with this presentation. Uh, so, dear participants, my students, my colleagues, I can see them as well among the the audience. So, do you have any question in relation to this very interesting topic? Maybe I can uh, ask a question, uh, especially uh, you know that educated people and poor quality immigrants uh i understood that your presentation especially uh, educated people or uh, for example if i were a businessman uh, american uh, native uh, people uh, behave uh, towards to me uh, can produce too much bias against me or poor quality people if you put same desk, for example, uh, jobless people. Uh, mostly I understood that uh, your presentation relating poor quality pe uh, immigrants. Uh, am I right? Uh, well, no, the immigrants that, that I studied, they are professionals and they are well-educated, but they had um, subordinates. Okay, let's say, uh, for example, a faculty, okay, uh, a German faculty, she has, she had, um, you know, American students, she had um, different students from different countries, and she had like faculty secretary and blah, blah, blah. So all the women that I studied, they had a management position. What you are saying that, yes, I do agree. Uh, on the street, if I do go and try to communicate with someone, the story might be different. But this study is based on workplaces, and we collected their experiences in workplaces for both sides. So, uh, yes, I mean, I'll tell you this. Um, I learned English in northern part of the United States, but they have a different accent. And 
when I went uh, when I uh, moved to Kentucky, they do talk in a different way. So when I start talking, first thing that they I've been asked, I was like, "Well, you learn English in the northern part?" I was like, "Well, yeah. What is wrong with that, right?" So I went to a market and I asked for half a pound of something. And this lady, I mean, now we are talking about like less educated people that I'm in a daily life. Of course, we do face with these situations, and she stopped laughing. I was like what I have said, you know, what was so funny? And then she looked at me, she goes like, Han, you don't say health, you say health. She was just like, you know, correcting me. So, and I turned, I tried to be a smart ass. I said, do you understand what I said? And she said, yes. I said, then what is the problem? You know, <laughs> but at workplaces, you will not have, never see those kind of things. But when you work with your subordinates, like uh, one of the lady I do remember, she had um, some people that uh, American people work under her. Uh, she had problems. She said that they were mimicking her the way that she talked. So it was, you know, it's not a really good situation at workplace because uh, you are losing your authority if somebody starts mimicking you or making fun of you. So it happens, but uh, in a professional level, in a relationship, it doesn't, um, yeah, it, it doesn't affect, but hope I answered your question. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor. Okay, you're welcome. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Yusuf Hocam. Any other question? Dear participants, okay. Let I love me, questions. <laughs> yeah, let me ask. Uh, not very related, but I just want to learn. Uh, considering the geographical situation, location of Kentucky as a state, uh, is it? Uh, as far as I know, it's just a mixture of. Southern and Northern, uh, it's it's not a pure uh, Southern state. So uh, from from the history of America, United States of America, uh, Southern states are considered to be, you know, truly conservative and not uh, inclusive enough uh, con uh, considering the, the Northern states. So uh, what do you think about the common situation in Kentucky uh, in, 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 in within the respect of, within the context of tolerance or intolerance, discrimination? Uh, and I would like to uh, ask uh, or add the, the, the contemporary situation of African-American people, you know, they are not, uh, uh, it's not fair to you know uh, categorize them, them as Im immigrants uh, within the immigrant groups because uh, because considering the historical uh, the situation of slavery uh, dating back to the discovery of the continent. So uh, how do you right now in uh, in the state of Kentucky? How do you uh, observe the situation for? Uh, for for the oppression of African American people, uh, uh, African American people, or how people, um, if people discriminate international people, I'm sorry. No, uh, yeah, you can also you can also man mention about the the rest the 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 other immigrant people uh, uh, apart from the African American uh, origin, but. Uh, I my 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 first focus is uh, to understand the current situation of African American people. How the uh, white uh, vast uh, people uh, consider uh, African American uh, people in Kentucky, or you can also give a comment uh, as a general comment on the current situation in in the United States of America. Well. Um... I am thinking about both sides. Uh, yes, it is related with the geography, but when I say geography, um, you know, United States is a very, very, um, you know, big land that they have still big land over there. And like, um, okay, there's a state, in state there are counties. It makes, the, the counties makes up, uh, make up the, the states. Mm -hmm. And in counties, there are cities. That, you know, in one county, 
it could be four or five cities. And interestingly, okay, federal government has regulations, state has their own regulations, Chinese has their own regulations, and adding to that, cities have their regulations. Okay. For okay. example, one county may not allow selling alcohol. Okay. They say that, okay, in my border, you cannot sell. But then inside that county, that city may say, hey, look, I will sell alcohol in my border. So because of that, it, it changes a lot. Um, in Kentucky, there are like a couple of big cities. In that in cities, there is no problem. But if you go eastern part of the Kentucky, I mean, I heard, I mean, I know that there are some places that they don't have a water. You know, they use like well water, and um, I, I don't remember if they have electricity. But when I, when, you know, when I heard, I was shocked. I was shocked that in the United States there are some towns that they don't have um, a clean water, and so wherever you are. Uh, people's behavior changes, attitudes changes, okay, toward um, internationals or toward um, <clears throat> African Americans. Uh, if you are going to talk about African Americans, again, if you go north, it's a little bit different. If you go south, it is a little bit different. But what I saw there, again, it's my observation, okay, is not literally, uh, it's not proved in literature. African American people are more, um, you know, um, discriminative than white people. And what I saw, uh, I mean, I did work with, uh, you know, at workplaces, I had some um, co workers, but, um, you know, they were not really engineers or faculties or something like that. They were like secretaries, and I did work with people. But that's that's what I saw, and also I saw that um, you know, like international people, they don't feel comfortable, just you know, I don't know, being there, and they are kind of um, really mad for the history, how they came, that slavery things, and um, you know, even like long time ago, they still carry uh, it, that hate passes or sadness or I don't know how you uh, you, you say it in cultural um, studies we call it uh, colonial melancholia or for uh, for ex uh, colonizers uh, I, I'm talking about the uh, the experience colonial experience of the UK uh, the British Empire so after the empire rights back the decolonization of the colonize the colonize colonizational process of uh, soon after the second world war uh they you know they they got uh up from a long sleep dream and they they felt that the empire is was over uh, there is uh, no such a uh, empire on which the you know uh, the on on which the the, the sun never set so uh, they uh, they began to feel the the pain of the the loss of the empire. So, uh, for example, Paul Gilroy, uh, one of the leading cultural theorists of British culture uh, cultural studies, he he defines this situation as a post colonial melancholia. So they they do not still accept. Doctor, uh, I just I have to interrupt you, but. Um, sure. I'm not sure if we can call this as a colonization because these people they forced to come to United. Actually, they were sold, right? They they are forced to come. They it was like kind of forced immigration. I mean, they basically they purchased them, right? So mm -hmm. um, what you are saying, at least they are in their own land. Right, and they have people around them that they are familiar. But for these people, um, they just forced, and they they had no clue. Even like you know, some of them were taken from Kenya or Uganda or something like that, which mm -hmm. they had no clue. And they have this this question in their mind all the time. I don't know where I am from. If I am from Kenya or if I am from Nigeria or if I am from there. So there is a lost identity there and it bothers them a lot. 
and they still uh, they cannot get over um, over with. And then again, as I said, they carry this from elderly to younger people. That's why nothing. I mean, you know, changes is very hard, and they do create kind of like their own culture. Uh, not in the educated uh, among the educated people, but like teenagers or some other people, they change language. Okay, to be verb, right? They don't use m i r or something like that. They always use b i b u b. You know that kind of things because uh, they want to be a different. You know their clothing system is different. So it is kind of like uh, protesting what um, what is um, going on. Yeah, there. it's a, it's a way of challenging the the yes. dominant yes. Uh, the yes. hegemonic force. You know. Uh, yes. Yeah, but, but why I I mentioned post-colonial or colonial studies? Yeah, uh, literally or uh, uh, you know considering the category, the the experience of African people uh, who were forced to you know uh, live and work, uh, provide their labors in the states. Uh, they they but uh, there is uh, another movement of uh, post-colonial studies or the the academics from uh, that department, uh, that that field, they uh, they came up with you know uh, with the the experience of colonialism, which uh, you know uh, forced all the Africans or the African geography uh, forced to yeah they they were forced to live and work in the United States, but all the intangible you know intangible uh, elements of their geography were taken uh, towards uh, the states so the it's 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 a contemporary commentary on on this field so the it's 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 claimed that there is not uh, tangible but uh, are related uh, you know uh, linkage between the geography so that's why they attribute their experiences to to colon, post colonial or colonial studies but in uh, you know as a general uh, definition in cultural studies of course we we you know we handle we study uh, the experience of ex uh, slaved or, or today as we call african american people in a in a different sub subcategory or subculture as you as you mentioned with their different, different, uh, different ways of uh, clothing, or or you know, uh, different ways food of and, yeah, representing they, their cultures food. in relation to music, different uh, some other different uh, kinds of arts, you know, um, daily life activities, food culture. Uh, these are you know very popular and preliminary uh, elements of cultural studies. Uh, sorry for interrupting you. Uh, I just wanted to. No, 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 no. Like the other, I mean, uh, to me, well, I mean, yeah, of course, um, you know, African American people was a case in the United States, but I think um, the Hispanic people, especially Mexican people, are uh, very vulnerable over there. And unfortunately, I'm not there and I don't, um, I haven't done any study, but if I have a chance, I would love to um, study that. I think Sultan has a question. Sultan? Uh, thanks for uh, very valuable information, Hoca. Uh, I you. want to question, do you think the melting politicized is useful? Uh, do not people lose the native culture and characteristics? It is a good uh, to have different we know that we uh, we are all children of Adam and Eve. Even the separation of people into um, different languages in a theory is an example of this. Um, but uh, still, uh, I want to question: Do you think the politicize of melting is courage? Thanks, Hojan. It's um, melting. I, I'm sorry, I couldn't get it. Melting pot. A oh, melting pot. Ah, oh, okay. Um, well, no, I don't agree. That's why uh, lots of scientists, social scientists didn't agree. That's why they come up with a salad bowl. Uh, as I said, in a salad bowl, you can um, you can name or see the whole uh, ingredients, right? Tomatoes, peppers, and blah, blah, blah. So what does it mean? It means that you 
uh, preserve your uh, culture, your identity, you know, your language, your faith and everything. But what does it mean? You live together in a, in a harmonious way, you know, in a peaceful way, in a delicious way. Let's put that way. <laughs> okay, I hope I answered your question. Thanks, Sushan. So our professor, Sultan, our pro professor is in favor of multiculturality, diversity, not uh, <laughs> assimilation <laughs> or exclusion of, uh, of, the, of the cultures, the, the cultures that uh, represent the cultural baggage of the immigrants in the States. Thanks, Sushan. Welcome. Another question? Hi, uh, hi uh, sir. Uh, I'm Edil Mural. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Uh, when we consider about the salad bowl, uh, were there any barriers, any obstacles in intercult intercultural communication? If there were, what were they? Uh, you know, whatever you say, whatever you do, it is going to be a, a problem, right? Um, because integration takes time. And even there are discussions that if it's integration is necessary. I mean, I was like, why do I need to, um, to integrate, you know? Uh, and there are, uh, maybe um, Dr. Ishik would, would know of this too. There are, it's categorized like integrated or not integrated or they kind of like, I don't remember the, uh, the terminology, I'm, I'm sorry. But people, when they immigrate, um, they refuse their own culture, they refuse the, the host uh, country's culture. Mm -hmm. And um, the one, they refuse the host, uh, host culture, but they kept, um, they kept their home We culture. call it in-betweenness, yeah. Yeah, so, um, mm -hmm. it, it happens, and... Right now, salad bowls make sense to me because, um, you know, growing in a culture, okay, I put, that's what I said, I, uh, the, the uh, one of the criteria for the participant was not native English speakers, okay? Like, you can immigrate there, and if you are young, or if you are a teenager, you learn like this, and you speak with, a, with, a, with an accent, you know, you are a native speaker, which I had one participant like that, and I had to exclude her. I said, well, I'm sorry, because you do speak like, like Matisse. So this, um, you know, problem will, will, will continue, but hopefully... Now, actually getting you know getting smaller and smaller but um this is not an easy thing to work on it so it's better for us to as i said accept differences our differences and um live with it <laughs> thanks for your answer it's kind of you <laughs> thank you welcome thank you very much Edith. uh any other question dear guests I do see something on chat. Let's see if uh, no, Nuvit Hoca, the senior academic of our department, she was uh, really kind to attend uh, for the first 45 minutes. So she had to leave because she had another, she, she has another class with our four year students. Uh, she is really pleased to see you, see your presentation, and she thanks both of us and uh, the organizers, all the organizers of, of this activity. Uh, she had to leave earlier, so uh, she she just pardoned. Uh, another question, dear participants, or else if you, uh, Professor, if you don't want to add something else, I would like to thank you for your presentation. Thank Mr. Pojan, would you, you like me. to add? <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 very kind of you to to be here. Yeah. Also, uh, I would like to thank Professor Harika Suplun. Thank you very much. Uh, we learn all the tiles relating to uh, intercultural communication. Thank you very much. Thank I you. am also thank very you. grateful for the participation of uh, Yusuf Oja, Prof Associate Professor Dr. Yusuf Chinar, because as you see, he is really uh, sick and he has healthy problems right now. So 
it was uh, it was uh, his courtesy and kindness to attend in any case thank you very much we are uh, we it are was really... in, it was in that question, mm. <laughs> thank you very much thank you thank you uh, so it's time to close up the this session thank you very much again associate professor dr uh, harika sütkin hocam sütkin hocam uh, uh, it was it was great to have a, such an introductory and but very uh, knowledgeable very uh, you know uh, stimulating uh, brilliant uh, presentation to to Thank get you. our our students and participants familiarized with such uh, very uh, contemporary and uh, very popular topics uh, within the context of language communication and culture we are we are really grateful thank you very thank much thank you thank you thank you see you bye bye okay see you bye bye <laughs>